All right, everybody, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate you all coming here and spending your morning with us. My name is Galilea, I go by Gali, and I am the campaigns coordinator at Voto Latino, and I will be moderating the session today. Um, so disinformation is a problem that affects everyone, but specifically communities of color. In this panel, we'll hear from the experts and discuss the various ways disinformation impacts the communities they work in, and ways it potentially leads to voter suppression, and how we work to combat it. So let's get ready to hear from the ex experts. I'll kick it off to Rose for introductions. Good morning, everyone. This is a microphone that I should use. Good morning. My name is Rose Lang Meso. I'm a campaign manager at Free Press. We are a media and tech justice nonprofit. Um, in my previous work, I've worked for Common Cause, doing disinformation monitoring around elections, working a lot in non-English speaking spaces online, as well as in different communities of color. And I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Um, and I'm really looking forward to a great discussion. Liz, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, I'm Liz Lebron, the research manager at Voto Latino. Voto Latino is the largest voter registration organization that's focused on Latinx voters in the country and we're also one of the top voter registration orgs in general in the country. I'm very proud to be here to talk about how disinformation impacts Latinx voters and disenfranchises that community and what we're doing about it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Renata Robinson. I'm the research director at New Georgia Project. We are a grassroots, nonpartisan uh, voter engagement organization that um, serves the entire state of Georgia. And we rolled out our disinformation program in January, and we're focused primarily on disinformation that disenfranchises black voters. And I look forward to this panel discussion this morning. Hi everyone, my name is Kyle Van Fleet. I am the communications associate at Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote. Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote, which we often call API Vote for short, is the largest nonpartisan national organization seeking to empower AAPIs through civic engagement. And of course, we cannot empower our communities to get involved in um, voting and everything else that there is to get involved in if they're being uh, exposed and the target of disinformation. So we do monitoring of narratives related to voting rights, democracy, elections, and of course narratives about our communities and narratives that originate from our community. So I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Great, thank you all. So I'll start it off with a question. Disinformation usually lives within our communities and oftentimes it is about our communities as well, which is an important distinction to make. Um, each of these dimensions brings with it different problems. How do you see that in your role or organization? I'll start with Rose and then we can go down. Yeah, thank you so much, Golly. I really appreciate the question. I think since we're starting here, I'll start at a more macro level and I know my fellow panelists will talk more about specific communities. Again, something that I think is so important to emphasize is that there are disinformation narratives about communities, right? So like all Arab Americans think X. And then there are disinformation narratives that communities spread inside. So something that I saw a lot when I was doing election monitoring in Florida um, were some Latinx voters saying, oh, you know, this candidate is a communist or this candidate actually doesn't believe in voting, right? So there are two different types of disinformation and both of them are pernicious. And both of these types of disinformation are being used by bad actors to make it harder for people to vote and exercise their rights. So that is a huge problem and something that we see as we look for election disinformation across communities. This also becomes layered with other intersectional identities. So for me, I see a lot of disinformation about the LGBTQ community, and that is layered on top of narratives that are either about or spread within communities of color. So for example, right now, following Florida's Don't Say Gay bill, there's been a ton of, just such a, a disgusting uptick of narratives about uh, LGBT youth, teachers, anyone, parents being groomers, right? Just for being who they are and living as their authentic selves. This makes it much more difficult for people to A, live authentically online, and B, be able to actually understand what the facts are about candidates, about communities, and about themselves. So it's a huge, huge problem, um, and it's one that my fellow panelists and I are working every day to try to combat. And that involves pre-bunking these narratives, that involves giving truth sandwiches around narratives, 
narratives, right? So when we see disinformation, really making sure that we're putting factual information on either side and understanding how very specifically intersectional identity politics online work, right? So again, narratives that are impacting communities of color then are layered on top of in disinformation narratives that are impacting LGBT people. And it's a major problem and something that we have to address. That's an excellent question, Gali, and I'm glad that we're talking about that here. It's one of the reasons I was so excited to be part of this panel, because you know every organization here is dealing with the reality that disinformation is not going away, unfortunately, but communities of color really deal with disinformation on two dimensions. On the one hand, we're dealing with disinformation that threatens to disenfranchise our communities, depress turnout, depress um, support for democratic candidates, but on the other side, we are also the subject of disinformation. And what I mean by that is you might hear something about voter fraud, but that's very different than, you know, five million illegals voted in California. You know, this is something that, you know, it's spreading disinformation about an election, but it's also endangering our community. So at Voto Latino, we deal with that in two different ways. We deal with that with just dealing with the narrative of undocumented people and you know, this disinformation about them voting and the danger that that poses when they're set really as the target of voter fraud and the, the people who are committing voter fraud, but also from a countering disinformation standpoint. So at Voto Latino, we established the Latino Anti-Disinformation Lab last year to counter these narratives, and we do a lot of research. It's a partnership with Media Matters, and, you know, they help us monitor these types of narratives online, who is saying them, what's being said, how it's being spread, who are these networks of bad actors. But then there's another part of the organization that also deals with what does that mean to the people in our community, to the undocumented people who might become targets, to just Latinx voters in general. You know, we don't, you can't tell by looking at us which ones are undocumented people, you know, so it really puts our entire community at risk on a different level than just saying, oh, there's been voter fraud. So it's a really important point to make. And, you know, I want to thank Kyle for bringing this up as we were preparing for this panel. Uh, you know, we talked about some disinformation around COVID, you know, there again, and, and Kyle, I'll let Kyle speak to this, but, you know, the disinfo about the disease and then bringing in racial undertones that really hurt the Asian American community. So, uh, you know, I'll let him speak to that, but it's a, a component that is often missing from the conversation about disinformation, so I'm really glad that we can center that here. So for us, um, it, it's, so leaning into the, it's about us and within us, um, we are not just worried about folks switching sides, right? It's not just about the information is wrong and so now they'll vote differently. What happens a lot in the black community is that the disinformation depresses their willingness to go vote. Um, we've seen a lot of bad actors planting um, the idea that nothing is happening. Um, you know, in Georgia in 2020, we had uh, record turnout. And of course, from there was all this backlash. Um, but what we've seen since then is this idea that because of their vote, nothing has happened, and so why should you continue voting? And then we see that inside because a lot of the disinformation taps into those um, very, you know, rightfully um, so feelings about our disenfranchisement in this is in this country. But at the same time, we still have to celebrate the wins that we have seen, whether it's, you know, everything we wanted or not. Um, and so part of our, our mission at New Georgia Project is really making sure that we're positioning ourselves as truth tellers. Um, so a lot of what we do is making sure that folks know that they can come to us for the actual facts. We want to continue um, being the trusted messenger, but also making sure that we're telling the truth whether anyone asks us to or not. So we infuse into our scripts, we infuse into our social media posts, digital ads, all those things, repetitious facts. So if you come to us, or if we knock on your door, we came to you, we're going to tell you when, where, how to vote. We also, um, 
have launched a website, Ready, Set, Die, Vote, where you can put in your address and get all the information about your ballot that you need. Because we're trying to make sure people know that they're, um, they know where to go, they feel prepared, um, and so hopefully, uh, hopefully, hopefully, when they hear this information, they'll at least stop and say, well, I, New Georgia Project didn't say that, so maybe I should look into it. Um, but yeah, we, we are really sensitive to the fact that this information not just um, steers people the wrong way, but also will, will encourage them to stay at home, and we don't want that. Yeah, so piggybacking off what everyone else was saying, so in AAPI communities, it's you know very much the same. We are seeing a lot of disinformation narratives, like ex being exposed to our communities, being uh, spread through our communities. You know, we see stuff about COVID-19 and you know all that being a hoax, or like um, recipes to make a medicine at home that will prevent you from getting it right. Uh, we see disinformation about you know things as crazy as QAnon and of course, you know, unfortunately recently stuff about monkeypox and kind of like the over or undertones of homophobia and anti-LGBTQ sentiment with all that. And of course we see stuff about our communities and we've seen what that's led to, right? You know, with the ongoing pandemic, we've seen how uh, things like Wuhan virus have um, led to anti-Asian attacks, right? And so when we talk about disinformation, like, you know, we can talk about how it spreads online and, you know, maybe that leads to voting trends and such, but it also leads to real life violence, right? Um, so that is a very difficult thing that we have to deal with when we're talking about disinformation and especially racialized disinformation because it really can lead to the end of someone's life, right? So um, what we do at API Vote is we try to our best to monitor all these things and I think um, I don't want to speak for everyone else on the panel, but at least for our organization, we're nine people, right? And it's very difficult to have the capacity to do all the work that needs to be done to actually combat all there is online, right? And so while um, we do our best to see everything that's going on and push it out to our partners in biweekly reports, it's not enough, right? Um, we, need, we need more support financially and we need more research to be able to do what needs to be done. Um, and I just wanna add one other thing that um, I think hopefully, I think, I think everyone on the panel would agree with is an added layer is um, the fact that people who look like us will also push this type of disinformation, right? And they'll be used by um, bad actors to push their point even further. And so that's another challenge that we face um, when we talk about racialized disinformation is that, you know, um, I, I guess I'll name drop a couple people. When, when we talk about people like Andy No, right? Or Michelle Malkin, um, at least talking about the Asian American community, that, that, that makes combating disinformation even more difficult when people can point to someone, they're like, oh, that's an Asian American, and they agree with my far right point, excuse me, far right point, um, and so, that's a very difficult thing, and um, that's why we're here today, right, to talk about the fact that racialized disinformation is significantly different um, than just the general conversation of disinformation. Awesome, thank you, Kyle. And that is a great segue towards my next question, which is, what are your main challenges in your work to combat disinformation? And Rose, you can start with you. Absolutely. So at Free Press, we view ourselves as a connective tissue between a lot of activism, organizing on the ground, and the halls of Congress, where we know that some of this can change, right? So we serve as that connective tissue. That's also what my role is. I work on our campaigns work and our policy work. So that's how I view myself within this space. And there are a lot of challenges that come with that. An example that comes to mind for me specifically, and Kyle was just talking about this a bit, is how these online disinformation narratives that are so racially targeted have real offline harms. So I have the privilege of working with the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, and this group recently put out research that 55%, 55% 55 of people of color are afraid to go to their polling place. That's unacceptable. That, it, it, simply, it simply is unacceptable. That rate is far higher than white Americans. That rate is far higher than in any other year. That research came out two weeks ago, right? So we are fighting a fight 
of online disinformation, but then also what happens when that moves offline. That's some real disenfranchisement. When I was working in the 2020 elections, I saw false narratives that ICE were at polling places, where we then confirmed that ICE was not there. We sent people on the ground to check, to make sure that voters felt safe, that voters were not intimidated. ICE was not there, hard stop, right? So that's a huge problem and a huge challenge in our work. The second challenge is that disinformation happens in so many different online forums, right? So we work with a group called the Disinformation Defense League, and we work a lot on their policy platform. I urge all of you, if you are part of a nonprofit organization, to look up the Disinfo Defense League and to join our work. The Disinfo Defense League is run by women and people of color primarily, and we are working to help people have the tools to move what they learn from monitoring disinformation and move that to the halls of Congress, to move that to federal agencies like the Federal Trade Commission. And right now what is so challenging is that there are gaps and deltas between folks, people of color specifically, who are doing this work on the ground and monitoring for disinformation, and people at the FTC who honestly have not made spaces and rooms that are accessible to folks like us. It's a huge challenge, it's a huge problem, but I think that the first step to fixing it is getting these activist communities together to join in solidarity, cross racial partnerships, bring everyone that we can in, make sure that everybody feels safe at a polling place, that everybody has the correct information, and then bring that to the halls of Congress, bring that to federal agencies. And I think that together, everybody here on this panel, I hope, would agree um, that that is the right approach. It has to be a cross racial movement, and I think that here here is one of the first steps where we can really just publicly say, name it, and speak it into existence. And I'm very proud to be among my fellow colleagues. Some of the biggest challenges that we face with the Latinx community and non-English disinformation, and I want to clarify that I'm including disinformation about LGBTQ persons, because obviously uh, that's a community that exists across you know, racial and ethnic lines. So, you know, I want to be really clear that when there's an attack against that community, that includes Latinx voters. So I'm speaking for that as well. Uh, so some of the biggest issues that we face are really accountability on the part of the platforms because non-English disinformation is oftentimes underreported. It goes, you know, sort of under the radar. People talk about disinformation. And, you know, I understand uh, there's a lot of news outlets that you know, they report on English language things, I get that. But this really needs to be part of the conversation, especially as we talk about things like how are, you know, federal agencies dealing with disinformation. You know, that should always include non-English disinformation. Uh, it really flew under the radar for too long. That was really part of the reason that we established the Latino Anti-Disinformation Lab and Media Matters plays such an important role in that. They have a whole team dedicated to tracking disinformation in Spanish. So, you know, any media folks out there who are listening to this, you know, there are experts. These folks have been doing this now for two years. So, you know, we can speak to that with a good deal of authority and, and show you what's going on in non English disinformation, Spanish language in particular. So, holding the platforms accountable for that can be really difficult. You know, you'll hear something like, oh, we took down a million accounts last week that were spreading disinformation. What we need is more specificity. You know, how many of those were Spanish language? How many of those were Mandarin? Did you see attacks against a particular community? Did you see coordinated activity in a particular language against a particular community? And that's just not information that we're getting right now. That's really important. That needs to be part of the accountability conversation. Another challenge that we face is that there are closed networks like Telegram and WhatsApp. You know, you can look on Facebook, you can look on Twitter, you can look on Instagram and see the spread. You can see the network of folks who are spreading this information. But really, folks take that and take it into their private chats, and it's really difficult to infiltrate those channels and connect with those folks and say, hey, that's actually not true. So, you know, people grab this content and take it to those private networks from the big platforms. That's why accountability is so important. You know, people don't go into WhatsApp and start creating stuff. They go into the big platforms, grab it, and take it there. So accountability is a really big deal. Um, and, you know, another problem, and I, I think everybody here faces that, is that 
none of our organizations were founded to deal with this information. It's something that we've had to take on. And by take on, I mean divert resources from our stated mission, right? From, from our operational mission to deal with this because we can't avoid it. So everybody has limited resources to deal with this. And that's a challenge. You know, um, Kyle and I did a workshop yesterday on countering disinformation. And we had so many people come up to us afterwards. They were so happy that we included free and low cost alternatives to tracking disinformation because a lot of people and organizations just don't have the funding to do that kind of work. So it has been so critical for us in our work to partner with people like the Disinformation Defense League, like Media Matters, who do that kind of stuff full time. You know, um, if you've ever heard me speak, you know that I say this a lot, know your lane, know your capacity, right? Um, we don't have the capacity to tackle every disinformation narrative. We count on our partners. Uh, we don't have a division that deals strictly with the policy aspects of this. We count on partners like Free Press to help us navigate that landscape. So it is really critical that when dealing with disinformation, folks understand the limitations of organizations like ours. We were not built to counter disinformation full time. Our, our mission you know, at Voto Latino is to engage Latinx voters, bring them out to the polls, right? So this is in addition to, and we have limitations, we have challenges. So for us, um, I can definitely echo the challenges that have already been presented. Um, I would say one of our major challenges is that we are routinely um, a topic of disinformation ourselves as an organization. And so when that happens, we have to spend a lot of our time um, figuring out how to combat disinformation about us and what we do, especially as we are, again, trying to be the trusted messenger for disenfranchised voters all over the state. Um, so a great example was in 2020, um, during a press conference of our governor and state secretary of state, they said our names and said that we um, were the purveyors of voter registration fraud. So we had to er, stop what we were doing, <laughs> which was actually engaging voters um, to say, no, we like we do everything legal. <laughs> like, no, we aren't registering people in New York. We are registering voters in Georgia. Um, but what we were able to do in that instance was use the heightened media to tell our story better. Um, so for example, our CEO in State Ufot um, was invited to be on all kinds of news networks, MSNBC, CNN, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so at the beginning, she would answer the question, no, we did not do that. Um, but we would immediately pivot into, but let me tell you what we are doing and why this is important and why this election is important and why you should be thinking about the new Georgia majority, um, which is a coalition of all communities who are historically disenfranchised. Um, but it still, it, it takes a lot of capacity for our digital and our comms and our research and all of our other um, departments to be able to stop with their planning to do to talk about or to address or to combat um, consistent lies about New Georgia Project and what we're doing. Um, another challenge is funding. Um, so a lot of funders are interested in organizations like ours in election years, particularly federal election years. And so our funding is not always um, consistent, particularly in our years that are considered off years, but New Georgia Project and all of our organizations work year round no matter what, because our goal is not just to turn out the vote, it is to civically engage our communities and to make sure that they are sustained um, in their um, positions as the hirers and firers and folks who are to hold our politicians accountable. Um, and so with that, you know, one thing that's super important for all of us is really educating 
our partners, our funders, um, all of our stakeholders about the importance of our work, particularly, particularly disinformation year round. Because one of the things that we've seen is that our voters, even in non, you know, daunting election years, care about what's happening but they don't always have the information that they need. And so it's our job to make sure that we're connecting the dots, showing them how their vote matters, showing them what they can do when something's going awry. Um, and we need funding to do that. Yeah, so I can pretty much echo everything that's already been said. Um, I think I said it earlier, but API Vote is a nine-person organization, right? So we were not necessarily designed in the beginning to combat and research disinformation, but it's something that we've had to take on because it is such a pressing issue. We cannot empower Asian American and Pacific Islander voters if they're being if, if they're being exposed to so many false narratives. I mean, things like you know, I don't know if we've seen. Ice to the polls necessarily um, directed towards um, Asian Americans in the same way, but we've seen um, lots of voter depression type narratives, right? And we've seen a lot of stuff that um, is just uh, just completely a, a falsehood, right? So that's a very difficult challenge for us. I would say that's probably one of the foremost ones, and it kind of goes to what Renato was saying about funding, right? We we need more. Um, support to be able to one do this work to understand the spread and depth of disinformation narratives and also better coordination which is I guess the first point that I want to get into is that um, at least in the API community there are definitely groups who are doing this work but again because of the lack of financial support and um, also just lack of attention to the issue there just really isn't a whole lot of coordination among groups and that is definitely changing um, and API vote is definitely at the forefront of trying to get all these different groups together but the issue still stands that one people don't really think of it as an issue for API's or really any other community of color and then on top of that um, yeah, there's just, there's just, it's just not an issue that people are thinking about. And um, there's just not enough capacity for us to really come together. So that's the first thing. Um, but diving a little bit deeper, I think another really big issue, especially for the API community, is the fact that we're so diverse. Um, we have like over 50 languages, over 50 ethnic groups when you really break it down. And so when you try to try, uh, when you try to understand like the disinformation that's spreading in all of those different communities, um, it's difficult. You have to understand the cultural backgrounds of all these different groups. You have to understand the language, and you know it's not just understanding the language; it's understanding, you know, the, the lingo, right? Um, because it varies, you know, among communities, and so that's a very difficult um, thing to just even understand, like the surface level of what's happening across the board, right? Um, another thing is that we're across so many different platforms too. Um, you might have heard of WeChat. Um, that's something that a lot of Chinese folks use. Um, there's apps like Viber, uh, Weibo. Um, a lot of Indian Americans happen to be on WhatsApp. So the fact that there's so many different platforms also means that we have to have eyes in a lot of different places. And these platforms tend to have closed groups. And so unless you have access to those groups, which you know is something that can be done, but that's a lot of manpower. Um, and requires to have eyes in a lot of different places. So that's another thing going back um, to capacity. You have to have the capacity to be able to do that. Um, and one other thing that I want to mention is, I think this was alluded earlier, but non-English disinformation, a lot of social media companies like aren't really paying attention to that. But then on top of that, the fact is um, disinformation in any other language other than English just typically isn't taken down. So there might be an argument to me made that communities of color that speak different languages are exposed to more disinformation than maybe those who only speak English, because at least those who speak English, those posts might have the ability um, or the chance to be taken down. But when it's not in English, then it will probably stay up. So that's, that's another really big challenge. Great, thank you. Uh, Rose, this question is for you, and it's a segue off of what Kyle just mentioned with non-English disinformation. How is non-English disinformation distinct from disinformation in English? Thanks so much for that. Um, first of all, non-English disinformation in any non-English language is going to be different from each other. So Spanish language disinformation is going to be different than disinformation in Arabic, right? So I just want to level set there and make sure that that's completely clear. One of the main differences is how English content 
somewhat is moderated, like Kyle said. Um, the platforms are investing more in English content moderation than in non-English languages. So something that Free Press has been pushing for years is that the platforms at a minimum should be funding their non-English disinformation efforts and their moderation efforts proportionally to how they are funding it in English. Right? This makes a difference for US elections. It makes a difference for people of color who may or may not um, be getting most of their information in languages other than English. And it also has a global impact as well. So that's the first problem. An example of this that I can think of specifically is there was a Facebook post that had disgusting disinformation that is almost unrepeatable. We asked Facebook to remove the post in English and they did within a week. We then found it in Spanish and it took Facebook 11 months 11 months to remove the same content that they found to be violative in English. It's unexcusable. There is truly no excuse. We had the privilege of hosting a roundtable on this issue with Senator Lujan and Senator Klobuchar online based out of DC. They asked and we talked about some of the real questions about Spanish language disinformation. And so far the platforms have not given us real answers. We don't know what content moderation looks like. We don't even know if folks who are moderating in non-English languages have basic human rights, if they have supports, mental health supports, to see all of these disgusting things that they have to see. We don't know if content moderators are contractors or if they're full-time employees. And I imagine if they were full-time employees, Facebook, Twitter, all of the platforms would be running to tell us, right, if these were full-time folks. So now, we have a problem. We have a lack of moderation. We have a lack of funding for that moderation in non-English languages. And the brunt of that labor at the platforms is likely being done by people of color who are underpaid and who do not have the same rights as regular employees of this company. So it's a major issue. We know that there are disparate impacts and we also know that there is disparate um, outcomes in terms of moderation. And so this is something that we are bringing with the Disinfo Defense League to the Federal Trade Commission through their open comment process. And I'm more than happy to talk with anyone about that later because we need to hear your stories. And if there's one thing that you take away from me talking, it's that we need you in policy conversations. We need people of color to come and show up with us. We need people who don't speak English, who are, who, for, for whom English is a second language and for whom they are not getting all of their information in English to come with us and to tell your stories. Because policy, the halls of Congress and the Federal Trade Commission are not just places for people with fancy law degrees, it's for everyone. And that is a major issue when it comes to the non-English disinformation that we seek, because right now, that's not getting enough attention because we haven't been able and haven't been given the opportunity or a seat at those tables. Thank you, Rose. Liz, um, Rose just mentioned holding uh, these social media platforms accountable is a really big thing uh, to combat disinformation. And you mentioned that as well when you were talking about the challenges that you face. So my question is, what is Voto Latino doing to address disinformation in the Latinx community, specifically non-English disinfo? I would love to answer that question. Before I do, I wanna touch on something Rose just said. We don't just need people of color at these tables. If you're at this table and you don't see us, bring us with you, call us, we wanna come, right? So if you're at this table and you don't, you look around and you don't see us, you need to speak up and say something and say, hey, disinformation impacts communities of color. I know four people, I just met them, who can come and speak. I know folks who do media monitoring you know, Media Matters is here. Um, one of my colleagues is here, Ben and Son. We can come and talk, right? So we need your allyship. If you're sitting at one of these tables and you don't see us, you have all of our Twitter handles right there. Please connect because we are happy. Our bags are packed and we are ready to come and join you at these tables. So now to your question, Gali. Voto Latino is doing several things. I have mentioned a couple of times the Latino Anti-Disinformation Lab. That is a really big initiative that we undertook to really um, tackle this problem. Part of it was really leveraging Media Matters, 15 years of monitoring right-wing narratives online. So, you know, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. They're experts at what they do. We brought them with us. They stepped up and, you know, really ramped up a program to look at Spanish language disinformation. So it is invaluable to us to get that content on a weekly basis. They're out there in those spaces. And 
Lord bless them because it's hard. Listen, it is really difficult to be looking at this content all the time and they do it, they listen to it, they listen to radio shows. It's difficult to do. So, you know, we have that piece of it. But that's only one component, right? So that's telling me what is being said and who is spreading the disinfo. The next piece of that is doing research into who's listening to this and who is vulnerable to falling for these false narratives, right? And so as the research manager at Roto Latino, part of what I do is research for the disinformation lab. And we actually mapped out susceptibility to disinformation in the Latinx electorate. So if you are a practitioner and you in any way connect with Latinx voters, please find me. I can show you how to access these models in the voter file so that you can connect and see where you're doing, whether it's SMS, whether you're doing email campaigns, digital campaigns, knocking on doors, we can show you what the landscape looks like as far as who is vulnerable to disinfo in the corners you know, of the country where you have your programming. Um, so we mapped out susceptibility to disinformation. That's really key. That tells us you know, we've got the information, what's out there, who's saying it. That tells us who's listening. And that's really important. As I said, all of us here have limited resources, right? It doesn't do us any good to spend money targeting folks like me who obviously are not listening to that kind of you know, narrative. It doesn't serve an organization to spend money targeting folks like us, right? So we're helping you be more efficient and effective with your limited resources. And then the third piece of that is strategic communication, right? So we're also producing content. There is a content deficit on our side um, trolls don't sleep, and neither should you. They don't stop. They're out there putting out this information at all hours of the day and night. And I want to be clear, they don't stop on election day either. Right? So if anything, what we saw was quite the opposite. After 2020, they ramped up. You know, they really took the big lie, ran with it. Disinformation really ramped up. So everyone watching this panel today, please remember, they're not gonna stop on election day, and you can't either. You have to own your organization's mission, keep being that credible voice in your community, keep creating that content, keep putting it out there. The folks who are, you know, they don't quite believe all the false narratives, but they're kind of like, hmm, is that true? I don't know. You wanna be what they find when they go on their computers and search. You want your content to be what they find. So keep producing it. And I know that it's labor intensive. I know there are, just because something is free, right? It's free to use social media. I know there's a, a cost in terms of man hours. Get your content out there. Go on podcasts, do panels like this, write in your local papers, you know, be out there because they're out there with that false information. Um, don't worry about being perfect. You don't have to be the perfect messenger. Just be out there, get your content out there. So that is the final piece, is that strategic communications piece. And what we've done is really gone out there and gotten stories from our community in our own voices, unscripted. We ask folks questions, we let them talk, we make content using their voice in the stories and we just, share those stories about different policies and the ways that those policies impact our community, the positive things. Um, you know, it's really easy to lose the wins. You know, Renata mentioned you have to really celebrate your wins. So we do that by talking to folks about how those little and big wins, right? We just had big wins on gun legislation, climate, right? It's been a long time coming, right? So. We're talking to folks about how that impacts their day-to-day -day lives, and we're sharing out those stories. So when the disinfo is out there, so are we. We're meeting them. They come. Our content is out there, too. Thank you, Liz. Renata, as Liz mentioned, whenever we do reach out to communities, um, we're interrupting the the disinformation that's out there already. So my question to you is, we know the facts are not as impactful when individuals and communities negotiate truth. So how can we improve the ways in which we interpret, sorry, interrupt disinformation within our communities? Thank you for that. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is um, leveraging uh, technology. So we are working with a software called Junkopedia. 
um, to create a tip line. So as Kyle was saying, capacity um, is limited, right? Um, there is so many, we, we have two disinfo associates um, so there's only so many social media platforms or groups or whatever it is that they can look at. Um, also, they both live in the Atlanta area, and like I said before, we service the entire state of Georgia. So we need to make sure that we're not just um, in groups that include folks in Metro. We need to make sure that we're capturing what is being said in the rural areas of Georgia as well. And so with this tip line, um, we're recruiting everyday people to screenshot what they're seeing um, so that we can then either message to it or figure out how, the, how we can contact folks. Um, because one, we work closely with our comms and digital departments to pre-bunk. Um, and we also work with organizing and field to make sure that our scripts are um, addressing anything that we know people are talking about in the community. But also we want to make sure that um, we are talking to folks one-on-one -on, -one on social media so that if we can go ahead and say, hey, that's not true, here's some more information. Uh, we have a, a unsexy website called <laughs> No Cap, No Cap. So no N-O cap and, you know, slang for uh, lies, no cap, so K-N-O-W, so no lies, but also be able to recognize the lies. Um, so on this site, we have questions that we know people are, people have um, that has more information, the truth about whatever that is, and then a link to a, a source that is credible, so that if they want to learn more, it's accessible to them. Um, the other thing that we're doing, and it's important to note that we, in 2021, we did research to understand what do black voters consider powerful? What makes them feel like their vote is more powerful? And the first thing that grabbed our eyes is that it is not electing black politicians. It is seeing that their vote, the, their vote resulted in resources being deployed to their communities. It's actually seeing change. And so one of the things that we're doing is we have a Thank You Georgia campaign um, to highlight those things that have happened that would not have happened if uh, November 2020 and January 2021 had not happened. Um, and things that are not highlighted in the media. So for example, um, there was a farm, a farmer's relief bill that targeted um, farmers of color in Georgia um, and other states as well. Um, but we lifted that up because we need our communities to know this happened and it would not have happened had you not turned out to vote in January 2021. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that we're amplifying the truth. Um, and then also in the same vein as what Liz was talking about, we're trying to couple those digital ads with social media posts that highlight everyday Georgians talking about how their policy impacted their lives. And so with that, um, we're actively going against this narrative that nothing happens. You vote, nothing happens. Why are you still voting? Um, we want to, to acknowledge, celebrate, reinforce that what we did in 2020 and 2021 was impactful and that we, can, we should continue doing that. Thank you. And Kyle, this question is for you. What does the infrastructure for combating disinformation in AAPI communities look like? Yeah, so thank you for asking this question. I think I alluded to it earlier, but um, it is relatively fragmented and I, I just really wanna emphasize that. And that's not because there isn't a desire for you know a more united front. And there is efforts to change that. There is a group that API Vote is a part of and is part of DDL, the Disinformation Defense League, called the Asian American um, Disinformation Table. And this is kind of like one of the first efforts to bring several different organizations together to share research, to coordinate messaging, to um, create 
deliverables such as, you know, like we actually just released a 50 page report on kind of the, the context of why Asian American um, disinfo is unique and there's a lot of case studies. So if anyone wants to look at that, it's at Asian am, am, uh, disinfo.org. But um, yeah, the fact is that even though there are these efforts changing, there just isn't that capacity. Um, I do want to give a shout out to a few different organizations who are doing that work. Um, there's Chinese for Affirmative Action, who um, obviously kind of focuses on education and issues related to that, especially in the Chinese American community. Uh, there's the Xinxiang Project, which is actively pushing out narrative, or excuse me, not narratives, but pushing out um, messaging on apps like WeChat, uh, which is where a lot of Chinese Americans are being exposed to this info. Um, they're putting out progressive um, counter messaging and inoculating folks um, before they do see that really awful messaging. Uh, there's also Indian American Impact who studies and puts out um, content uh, specifically related to issues um, that are impacting Indian Americans. Um, it's called Desi desifacts.org, I believe. Um, and then of course there's a group called Equality Labs, maybe you all have heard of it, who does a lot of research for um, South Asian uh, related issues. So long story short, the, the I just want to emphasize the fact that there are all these groups and there are efforts to kind of bring us all together, but because there is just such a lack of funding, there is just such a lack of capacity that just hasn't quite happened yet, but it is changing. So the infrastructure is not as quite built as it is for other communities or just the, the entire disinformation um, kind of research um, ecosystem in, in general, but that, it, that, it, that is changing, but the, the conversation definitely needs to shift to the fact that this is an, is, this is an issue impacting AAPIs and there needs to be um, more of a focus on that. Thank you, Kyle. And this question is for all of you, so feel free to jump in. Um, what is the lesson you've learned through your work that you want people to know and implement in their own work? It's a good question. And slime at the end, I suppose I will start. Um, I think what's so important when we're looking at disinformation online is that we need to meet communities where they are in whatever that process is. So Vota Latino has put together that incredible susceptibility model that can help to do that. Being at Netroots has only reinforced for me how important it is that we keep doing this community grassroots work. New Georgia Project is doing incredible work on the ground. Kyle and API Vote, they're you know, able to work with communities that simply I do not have access to, right? So I can't understand the whole narrative. And so it's really important that we're meeting people where they are and that we're empowering people to make their online experience their own. I work a lot in platform accountability and tech justice. And right now, the tech companies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of them are making supposed identities about us, making it so our identities online are no longer our own. And that, that simply isn't right. So if you have the opportunity and the ability to connect your grassroots work into groups like the Disinfo Defense League or into groups that are monitoring disinformation so that way we can all be in a united front when we go to the halls of Congress, when we engage in these policy debates, when we go to the Federal Trade Commission, that is one thing that you can do that is extremely helpful. Again, we need your voices. We need the voices of the grassroots of people who historically have not been invited into these conversations and we need you all to meet folks where they're at and then bring folks with you bring folks with you into the conversations and make sure that there is that connective tissue i try to do that in my work free press tries to do that we try to connect the grassroots with the policy to demystify the process of what it looks like for people to have their civil rights and privacy protected online it is not up to companies to decide who we are. It's not up to them to determine what our online experience is. It's up to us. And so I leave you with nothing else besides what I said before about joining DDL. Um, it is also that it is more important now than ever to help make our experiences, to own our experiences online and to make them our own. Thank you for all the work that you do. You really, Free Press does such a phenomenal job of demystifying that process. Uh, some of this stuff is so wonky and so in the weeds. It, it can be really difficult to process, but you know, every time I go to one of your briefings, I learn something and I, I'm like, oh, I get it. You know? So thank you for everything you do. Um, if you walk away with one thing that I have learned on the Voto Latino side, it's 
don't go chasing narratives. Um, you know, you can't deal with all of the disinformation out there. It's just impossible. We need you to be experts at the thing that you do. We need you to be great at what you do. You know, I need Rose to be amazing at the tech accountability policy stuff. I need Renata to be amazing at, you know, helping me connect with black voters. I need Kyle to be that uh, trusted messenger that can connect me with API voters. Don't chase narratives. You know, disinformation is something that really, if something isn't impacting your mission or your organization directly, and Renata gave a great example, obviously if the attack is about your organization's credibility, there's an impetus to respond there, but otherwise don't chase narratives. You know, just focus on being that credible voice in your community. So when you speak, your community members say, ha, huh, okay, API vote said, this, that must be a credible thing. Let me go at least follow up on it, right? When Voto Latino says, this is what's happening with the election, we need to be a credible voice to our community. We need Latinx voters to sit up and listen, right? So we focus our counter disinfo efforts on election related disinformation that threatens to disenfranchise Latinx voters, right? Unfortunately, we can't focus on every type of disinformation. So. That is our focus, and we do it day in and day out by creating content all the time. Shout out to Norberto uh, Briseño, who is our amazing social media guru, who is out there every day creating incredible content that you know really resonates with people. We do that day in and day out. We will do it every day until election day. We'll do it the day after the election, and we'll do it every day until the next election. So if those are my takeaways. Don't chase narratives and just do this every day. Be relentless in defending your mission and being that credible voice to your community. I have a couple of things. Um, the first is, is in the work itself. Do not make people feel stupid for believing the lies. Um, we have to be compassionate to folks um, and understand that disinformation is an organized, long-term, direct battle um and so they're doing what they what it was targeted to do um so as we are talking to people let's not um downplay them um meet them where they are be compassionate and give them the facts and give them repetitiously um the second thing is it's so important to have relationships with the media um, sometimes what happens is, you know, people see a headline on Twitter, the Twitter amplifies the disinformation, the person never clicks on it to see that, oh, that it was wrong, all they saw was so-and-so said this incorrect thing. Um, and so when we have relationships with the media, we can help influence them to not do that, um, but also, um, we can feed our stories. So multiple people have said, like, be out there, um, do op-eds, you know, work with um, reporters on different stories. Um, but also, we have to support those independent media outlets, whether it's newspapers, radios, that are for um, communities of color. Um, in a lot of places, those outlets are still very much um, watched, listened to, et cetera. And so they need their support so that they can keep working and so they can keep pushing out the truth for their communities. Um, and then finally, we need more tools. And so I'm saying this because we're at Netroots and I know there are people out here who can build these things. It has been very, very difficult for us to find a social listening tool that is not aimed at brand management because we're not using it for brand management. We're using it to know what people are talking about so that we can tell the truth about those things or so that we can prepare ourselves for an oncoming threat. So for example, in Georgia, we were very, very worried about a mass shooting around Juneteenth. Um, so we need the tools to be able to see what folks are talking about and we don't wanna spend $40,000, $50,000 a year because that tool was created for a Clorox to know what people are saying about Clorox. Um, so if you are out there and you want to build a tool for nonprofits to social listening, 
let us know and we will support. <laughs> Um, so there's uh, five lessons um, that I'll quickly go over that I think that are important to share. The first one is something that I think everyone said, um, and that is working together is one of the most important things that we can do in um, confronting disinformation because, again, we all, or at least a lot of us, have limited capacity. We don't know everything. We don't have access to all the different communities that are impacted, right? So working together to get the bigger picture and push out good messaging is one of the most important things. And also want to just reemphasize something Liz always says, and that's know your lane, know your capacity. Um, and that goes into the whole working together because you shouldn't be looking for every little thing. Um, know what your organization, what matters to your organization, monitor that stuff, right? If you're a voting rights organization, you're probably gonna be looking at stuff related to elections, uh, democratic institutions. Probably does not make sense for you to um, necessarily monitor all the disinformation there is about Roe v. Wade, right? And so that's one of the most important lessons that I think any organization should take home. Um, another thing is that this work is all year round, right? Um, as I think also Liz said earlier, trolls don't sleep. Um, so this work needs to be happening 24 seven. And what I mean by that is not just the research, but also putting out good information, at least for AAPIs. Um, but I think it's also probably true for most communities and that is, it's not always about disinformation. Oftentimes, it's just about a lack of any information at all, especially for those who have limited English proficiency. And so um, making sure that you're going into those communities or you know where those spaces are online and you're pushing out information that is important, you know, whether it's as simple as a deadline to register to vote or it's something about um, how to get your COVID-19 vaccine and why those vaccines are actually safe, right? So it's something that needs to be done all year round and um, not just during election years. Another thing is, I think we've talked about the concept of how being a trusted messenger is super important because when people are looking to these bad actors, obviously that is the trusted messenger for some of these folks, right? So we have to be those trusted messengers and we have to build that agency, we have to build that um, respect but I think it's also important to know that you have to have a real uh, conversation with yourself. Depending on your, on your organization, you may not be seen as a trusted messenger to those who need to hear whatever message it is the most, right? Um, some organizations just might be seen as quote unquote leftist, leftist hacks or you know, part of liberal indoctrination. And you know what, even if you are the expert in whatever issue it is, if you're viewed that way by the people that need to hear um, the counter message the most, it's probably important for you to go into the community and find someone or someones that people actually do look to as that trusted messenger and work with them to get your message out, right? Because um, otherwise it's just gonna fall flat. I um, heard a story from a partner of API Vote, um, Ocapica, Ocap um, based in Southern California, and she was, uh, the, the executive director was telling me that there is a woman who um, kind of runs a small business of delivering food to those who just are unable to go get food themselves. And that she would use her ability as a trusted member of the community to push out messaging about like, you know, COVID-19 vaccines and how actually, you know, that's safe to these people who may otherwise be um, be susceptible to disinformation. And you know, she's not a political figure, she has no real authority other than the fact that she delivers food to these people in the community. But she was able to you know, get these people vaccinated and such just by just having ca casual conversations. So that's a really good example, I think, of finding someone in the community that people trust to get your message out if you are the type of organization that might be seen as um, an enemy, right? Um, and that also goes to something else that I wanna bring up and that is, Unfortunately, some people are just really, really, really far down the rabbit hole. Those are not the people to focus on. The people to focus on are those who are um, conspiracy curious and um, may be exposed to it, may not necessarily be convinced about anything yet, but have the ability to. Get to them before the bad actors do. That is one of the most important things, and that's also why this work needs to be 24-7, because it's something, um, I often just refer to it as inoculation. You might be know, you might be aware of what that is in like you know medical terms, but in disinformation terms, it's making sure people have good information and have access to you know 
just have access to reliable information before they're exposed to um, whatever bad narrative. Because by that point, when they see the bad narrative, they'll at least be skeptical of the fact um, that you know maybe maybe that's not true because I saw something else, right? That says otherwise. So that's really important. Um, and lastly, the one thing I want to um, end this question with is, especially for AAPIs um, and specifically uh, Asian Americans, is that you cannot research disinformation in our communities only from a domestic lens. Disinformation for Asian Americans and also Pacific Islanders, I think to a lesser extent, um, is 100% transnational, right? And so what I mean by that is the politics of one's home country unfortunately, or for better or worse, can impact um, the views and perspectives thousands of miles away, right? And I think one really important example is uh, Hindu nationalism and the fact that that's really infiltrated um, right-wing politics here in the United States. Um, it's gone as far as Steve Bannon being the honorary co-chair of, I, I don't remember the name of the group, but it's, it's a right-wing like Hindu um, Republicans type group, right? And so, it can go as deep as that because they see the potential for that type of transnational partnership to spread far right um, points, right? And so I think that's just a really important thing that you, ju you just cannot talk about um, AAPI disinformation only thinking about the, 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 the word American in that. It, 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 it's something that needs to be looked at from an international perspective. Amazing, well thank you all. This is all the time that we have. Thank you for being here with us and uh, letting us know more about disinformation. And I will leave you all with this, this lane, or the term that Renata said, no cap, no cap. I really love that. And so that's our tagline for today. Thank you all. <laughs>